tomorrow today. Fine, thanks. We're going to feel your neck and feel your carotid arteries. To assess the carotid arteries, palpate them one at a time. Using your index and middle fingers, gently palpate the artery medial to the sternomastoid muscle in the lower half of the neck. Feel the contour and amplitude of the pulse, which should be the same on both sides. Normally, the contour is smooth, with a rapid upstroke and slower downstroke, and the amplitude is moderate. Mr. Zamora, I'm going to use my stethoscope now and listen to your carotid artery. Next, auscultate the carotid artery. With the person's neck in a neutral position, ask him to take a breath, exhale, and hold it. As he does, lightly apply the stethoscope bell over the carotid artery at the angle of the jaw, mid-cervical area, and base of the neck. You should hear no bruise, which are blowing, swishing sounds that suggest turbulent blood flow and atherosclerotic narrowing of the carotid artery. Bruies sound like this. Mr. Zamora, I'm going to ask you to lie back. To examine the jugular veins, begin with the jugular venous pulse. To do this, help the person into a supine position at a 30 degree angle. Turn his head slightly away from you and direct a strong light tangentially across his neck to highlight pulsations and shadows. Look for the external jugular vein, which is usually visible over the sternomastoid muscle. Because the internal jugular vein is more reliable for assessment, but harder to see, look for its pulsations in the sternal notch, or the area where the sternomastoid muscle meets the clavicle. Don't confuse jugular venous pulsations with those of the carotid artery. Jugular pulsations normally have five components with two major upstrokes per cycle. They are more undulant and diffuse than carotid pulsations, which have one smooth rapid upstroke and a more gradual downstroke with a dichrotic notch. Mr. Zamora, I'm going to use rulers now. Next, estimate the jugular venous pressure. You'll feel me touch to do this, hold a ruler vertical on the sternal angle. Align a straight edge perpendicular to the ruler and adjust its height to the level of pulsation. Read the level where they intersect, which should be two centimeters or less. Mr. Zamora, I'm going to put your head If you suspect head. increased venous pressure, assess for hepatojugular reflux, which is an advanced technique. With the person supine and breathing quietly, you breathe and not press your right hand no, firmly into the right upper quadrant of his abdomen and hold it for 30 seconds. As you do, watch the level of the jugular pulsation. It should rise briefly and then fall to the previous level. I'm going to take a look at your chest now. Using tangential lighting to accentuate movements, inspect the precordium and observe for the apical impulse. When visible, it occupies the fourth or fifth interspace at or inside the midclavicular line. Note any abnormal visible pulsations, such as heaves or lifts, which are sustained thrusts of a hypertrophied ventricle. Heart disease is more prevalent and deadly among blacks than among other racial groups. So be especially alert for abnormal findings and a history of cardiac disease and risk factors in these individuals. Can you take a deep breath, exhale, and hold it for me, please? Palpate the precordium, localizing the apical impulse with one finger pad. If you have difficulty, ask the person to exhale and hold it. I'd like you to roll on your left side. If you still can't feel the impulse, roll him midway to his left to displace the impulse slightly to the left, and palpate again. After finding the impulse, note its location, which should occupy the fourth or fifth interspace at or medial to the midclavicular line. Size, which normally is one centimeter by two centimeters. Amplitude, which should be a gentle tap. And duration, which should be short. Roll on your back, please. 
using the base of your fingers. Palpate the apex. Left sternal border. And base to detect any other pulsations. Normally none occur. Note any abnormal pulsations such as thrills, which are vibrations that feel like a purring cat's throat and accompany loud murmurs. I'm going to be listening to your heart in several places. Just because I'm listening a long time doesn't necessarily mean that something's wrong. Before auscultating heart sounds, identify the areas where you will listen. Plan to listen in the areas where the sounds of the valves are heard best. These include the second right interspace, which is the aortic valve area, second left interspace, which is the pulmonic valve area, third left interspace, which is herbs point, left lower sternal border, which is the tricuspid valve area, and fifth interspace at the left midclavicular line, which is the mitral valve area. Also auscultate in other locations. Move the stethoscope slowly in a rough Z pattern from the apex of the heart, across and up, and then across the base. To evaluate heart sounds most accurately, focus on just one sound at a time and follow these steps. At each location, note the heart rate and rhythm. Identify S1 and S2. Assess S1 and S2 separately and listen for extra heart sounds and murmurs. With the diaphragm, first note the rate and rhythm of the heartbeat. Normally the rate ranges from 60 to 100 beats per minute, and the rhythm is regular. In Next, identify S1 and S2. Because S1 is the start of systole, it is the reference point for timing all other cardiac sounds. Usually, S1 is easy to identify because you hear two sounds close together, lubbed up, and S1 is the first one. To help identify S1 and S2 accurately, also remember that S1 is louder than S2 at the apex. S2 is louder than S1 at the base. S1 coincides with the carotid artery pulse, which you can feel when you hear S1 and S1 coincides with the R wave on an ECG monitor. Now concentrate on S1 and S2 separately, noting whether each sound is normal, accentuated, diminished, or split. Inch the diaphragm across the chest as you do this. S1 is caused by closure of the AV valves. It is loudest at the apex and sounds like this. At the base, S1 sounds like this. S2 is caused by closure of the semilunar valves. It's loudest at the base, where it normally sounds like this. At the apex, it sounds like this. In the pulmonic area, you normally may hear a split S2 toward the end of inspiration because deep inhalation prevents the aortic and pulmonic valves from closing at the same time. A split S2 sounds like this. Next, I'd like you to roll on your left side, please. After auscultating with the person supine, roll him toward his left side. Listen with the bell 